the most memorable moments came towards the end of the series when the CBC management had gotten tired of the of the some of the outrageous things that we were doing on the series and tried to get us to pull our horns in and eventually eventually close the series down. But we went to war publicly with the management, and uh, one of our top producers was an American newspaper man who just uh, relished the idea of getting all this stuff into the papers. And he had a lot of contacts in the newspapers, and we were on the front pages of the Canadian the major Canadian newspapers for about six weeks during this battle with the CBC as we tried to tried at first to get them to compromise and they tried to get us to compromise and it, it was really I mean we were we were doing things in, in the area of sexual liberty of uh, personal rights uh, I mean th the program was conceived as being a voice for the little guy against the establishment and television up to that point had largely been the voice of the establishment Stephen Truscott observed his 21st birthday in Collins Bay Penitentiary on January the 18th. He has spent one-third of his life behind bars. Management were very uncomfortable and we were being made increasingly uncomfortable by t politicians coming and saying, what the, how can you put up with these guys? They're so, they're so rude to cabinet ministers. I think that the, the main reason it got cancelled was that management were just so frustrated that they couldn't get us to, to compromise. and. Um, they didn't know what else to do, and we were not. We we were riding so high because we you see we had the biggest audience of any program on the air in prime time for a current affairs program. Nobody had ever heard of that before, and we were so sure of ourselves because of the the power behind that immense audience that it never occurred to us that we wouldn't win the the battle. How could CBC cancel their most popular program? There was a young man who had, was working with the Diefenbaker government, a man named Roy Fabich. He was an executive assistant to the Minister of Agriculture at the time. When we had our first production meeting late in the summer of 1963, we were planning the following season, and I had about four or five uh, staff members on inquiry, and we're sort of going around, what do you think we should do, what do you think we should do? And when we got to Fabich, he said, well, I don't know what the hell you guys are wasting your time. Why aren't we going to China? I mean, China is where it's all happening now. We got to go to China and make a documentary. And I said, well, <laughs> you know, we've all been trying to get into China for the last 10 years, and you just can't get in. And Roy Fabish said, I'll get you in. And then vividly, I was working in England, and it was in the middle of the night. I was waking up in my hotel room in London by a telephone call from. Hong Kong, and it was Roy he said, we're in. That was February, we went out in April, and, and there had been no independent documentaries made in China. There had been two documentaries made by Westerns, but they were all both paid for by the Chinese government, and they were propaganda films. And so the idea of an independent filmmaker coming in was, I mean, something that the television world was astounded by, and the Chinese themselves were pretty astounded, and they'd never had the experience of working with somebody who was you know, to make a real documentary, and it was quite an adventure. We we shot for a total of about two months, traveled 12,000 miles, and uh, just got to see stuff that, that nobody would seen. Ended up getting way out into the West Country where foreigners were not allowed, and got some very good interview material. And you were the mayor of Peking? Before liberation. Before liberation. No, I'm near 70 years old. The, the Heritage Minutes came about, I mean, it's, it was a, an unforgettable moment. I was on the, the board of Charles Bronfman's uh, personal foundation, which was called the, the uh, CFB, CRB Foundation, Charles R. Bronfman Foundation, and a, a large part of its function was to expand Canadians' understanding of Canadian history. And in a board meeting one day, he said, if we can use 60 seconds of television time to persuade people that Cadillacs are interesting, or cornflakes are interesting, <laughs> couldn't we use the same amount of time to persuade people that Canada's interesting and our history is interesting? You tell me how to do it, I'll pay for it. So we sat around for several hours at that board meeting uh, 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 saying, how would we do this? 
And somebody at some point said, well, we should make movies. That's what young people like. And somebody else said, hey, asshole, aren't you listening? We're talking about 60 seconds. And I remember saying, yes, of course, let's make 60 second movies. And then there was this discussion about how the hell do you make a 60 second movie? And we, we came out of it agreeing, and Charles agreeing to fund uh, a couple of pilots to see if it could be done. You are noting that it's the official mascot of the 2nd Canadian Infantry Brigade? Yes, sir. So long, Winnie. You'd be a good girl while I'm gone. Why Winnie, sir? From my hometown, Winnipeg. Oh, Daddy, I just love Winnie. Couldn't we take him home with us? Christopher Robin, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll write some stories about Winnie, and Mr. Shepherd here will draw some pictures. Oh, Daddy, let's call him Winnie the Pooh. Why Pooh, son? I don't know. Just Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> And that's how a young Canadian soldier's bear inspired four volumes of stories and verse and still sell millions of copies around the world. Uh, the single most important thing that you can learn as an interviewer is to listen. Um, you shouldn't go into an important interview situation with a very... I was going to say you shouldn't go in with a, a very elaborate plan. I don't really mean that. You should go in with an elaborate plan, but be prepared to ditch it at any moment if the person you're interviewing says something you've not thought of before and you're listening very carefully and you've done enough study of the background of this person and the issues that you're dealing with to be able to take off and improvise. Because what you're doing in the television interview is primarily creating a dramatic situation for the viewer. Nobody's going to remember the words that are spoken, but they're going to remember the tension, if there is any, between you and the, and the person you're talking to, and they're going to remember the emotional flow and you want that to have a kind of um, spontaneity and genuineness to it. And that means you've got to be prepared to listen and to improvise and take chances.